I don't know, what would you say, like, your learnings are there with, like, maybe open source, right? Because I don't think you really did that much at some yeah, period. Like, do you, have you, do you have any, like, epiphanies or learnings <sighs> there? Are stressful, right? Like, you know, all your, all your dirty laundry is, like, <laughs> bared out in the open, right? Like, I remember, like, I hired um, my other friend, Alex, um, who had worked at, with me at Zengrid and Twilio, and I remember at one point having to be like, you can't put... This is a little effity. I'm not sure how it works in the comments <laughs> in the code anymore. Hey, welcome to the podcast. I'm Mark Kabansky, CEO of Front of Masters, and today I'm speaking with Steve Kinney. Steve has been an awesome instructor over the last six plus years for Front of Masters, as well as he's had a fascinating career going from public school teacher all the way through to senior technical architect at Twilio Sangrid and now Temporal. So he's just a really fun guy to talk to, and I think we all have a lot to learn from his journey. So let's get right into it. Well, Steve. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're going to start up with some warm-up questions. All right. The first warm-up question is, I know you're a fan of superhero movies. Mm -hmm. uh, if, let's say I was uh, not a superhero fan, mm -hmm. but I wanted to get mm -hmm. into these, what would be three uh, movies that you'd recommend? I mean, so I mean, I, I don't think if one is not into them, they can start with the documentary Infinity War. Uh, <laughs> And it's a uh, sequel, Endgame. Um, I think, you know, like, for my son and I, it's predominantly the Marvel stream of movies. Uh, we don't acknowledge the existence of the DC uh, expanded universe. Uh, so, I, you know, it's it's uh, it's tricky. There's a, there's a lot to choose from, right? There is... Uh, so three to five. Three to five. Okay, yeah, now we have expanded. Five. I like... Uh, we really like Thor Ragnarok. Right. Uh, I think that's one that's really good. It's... Yeah, is it the third Thor movie? But the first two aren't that good. So you can you can jump right in, right? Like, the plot's not important, right? Um, so that one's really good. Uh, I'm trying to think what the other, like... Uh, you know, again, you, you got to jump in to, in to the deep end for some of the better ones. Like, Captain America Civil War is good. Don't worry about what happens beforehand. It's fine. You'll catch up. Um, and then I do like, you know, the the ones from, you know, four or five years ago. I, it's a little bit trickier. We were talking about this the other night, which is the moment any franchise introduces time travel, say goodbye to any kind of plot, like, whatsoever. So I do think that there's a lot of, like, character development across, like, the Iron Man movies and stuff along those lines as well. So, I, you know, you could just be a completionist and start from the very beginning and walk through 27 movies. Yeah. I like that. Uh, yeah, that gives me a little bit of a blueprint because yeah. I'm one of those people that, yeah, hasn't been into superhero movies, but I'll start with uh, Thor. Yeah, I wasn't either. I mean, I had the context, like, from when I was a child, but, like, it was predominantly through my son, right, who just showed up one day, like, let's watch, I think Infinity War was the first one, where there's a lot going on. Um, and I had to explain to him that uh, I had a lot of context, but when I was a kid, nobody cared who the Avengers were. It was all about the X-Men. Right. Uh, like was, the yeah. Avengers were some side characters that That's I true. had yeah. to acknowledge. Uh, but Spider Man's always been the best. So nice. Yeah, you were talking about time travel. I was reading this uh, kids series called The Bad Guys with my kids. Mm -hmm. And once they introduced like multiple dimensions and yeah. this kind of thing, it's like, yeah, this book series has yeah. completely given up. It's time to put but it I down. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, another warm up question. Any special skills that you have that people might not know about? That people don't know about. Um, the, the closest I can come up with is to a shocking degree of accuracy. I can look at almost any Fender guitar and tell you roughly what model it is, what year. Things like the radius of the fretboard and the spacing of the strings. Um, I can probably tell you that the size of the frets um, to a maybe not perfect, but a like very unsettling degree of accuracy. All right. So anybody who uh, sees this later, maybe a tweet at mm -hmm. Steve with a with a challenge and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they'll, they'll be up to it. it. Or if you like, if you just need to be, like, I have this Fender guitar. I need help identifying it. I'm I'm here for that because it's not the best use of my uh, 
brain power or memory or anything along those lines, but it's living rent free in there. So might as well take advantage of it. Might as well. So with that, yeah, obviously music has been a, a huge part of your life. Uh, could you explain maybe a little bit of your history with music and then also um, maybe what you're up to these days? Mm -hmm. uh, music is, I think, something that's been really important to me despite being really bad at it almost always, right? Like I have almost no rhythm. And um, I, I am good enough at guitar that if you handed me a guitar and I played it, you'd think that I was good for a moment until you put me in a room with actual musicians and it would be very clear that I can't keep up. Uh, I'm very good at like shopping for guitars. Uh, much better. I'm much better at shopping for guitars. I don't even buy that many. It's not even the purchasing of them. It's just the like perusing of, of guitars. Uh, but yeah, it is, it's something that's been there. And despite not having any like talent. I had a music teacher who was like, we're going to have you play bass for like every high school like thing for the rest of the year. I was like, great, that's awesome. And he was like, but I need you to know something. I'm like, what? And he's like, you're not very good at bass and you have no rhythm. I was like, yeah, noted. Um, but then like, why? Why would you like me to do this? He's like, well, it's like six hours of practice every Saturday and you're at least funny and all the other bass players are weird. So that has been my relationship to music for the most part. At least you're funny. At least I'm funny. Like, which doesn't really translate that well to the guitar, but uh, you know. Maybe a precursor to your career, where you hire, hired because you were funny. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's <laughs> that's that's the uh, that's a you know the large over overarching theme of our time together today. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have worked together for a long time, uh, probably going on maybe a decade now. Uh, what's something strange you've seen me do? Uh, there was the time that you were. Uh, <laughs> Doing what we what was best described as parkour, <laughs> which was practicing parkour, and it was uh, in Minneapolis. I believe it was like negative one thousand degrees uh, out, and uh, shattered. I, think I remember this. Yeah, yeah, I think you shattered a uh, a cone <laughs> just by touching it lightly with your foot. Yeah, yeah it was probably like thirty below all yeah. that night, wasn't it? It was egregiously cold. And then I thought I could kind of like you know just kick this cone or whatever, but it burst into yeah. pieces. To be clear, you did not apply a lot of force. <laughs> you simply very casually uh, touched it, and to which the Minneapolis cold did the rest. Yeah. I do remember that. Uh, wow. This is what people tune in for, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, let's take it back to your early career. What were your early memories of coding? Or your earliest memories? Earliest memories. Um, I believe it was like 1995, I took a class on HTML uh, and I made a GeoCities site. I bought a book on the JavaScript programming language when I was 14. Here's the thing about books. If you purchase a book, but you do not read it, none of the knowledge in that book enters your head. Uh, so I bought a book on JavaScript. Um, I did not read it. Uh, so I did HTML for a while, you know, just little things here and there. And then in college, um, I took a six credits, I think it might have been six credits for two semesters of a class called Folk Fest Management. Um, and in that, there was a lot of like orchestrating the New Jersey Folk Festival. My job was to make the website, uh, and to which I was handed a copy of Dreamweaver and told, go for it. Uh, that's when I became aware that CSS existed. I, it was still predominantly tables laying it out. Um, I didn't actually learn how to actually write any code until I was, I want to say, like 27. 28. Um, I had just been aware of and adjacent to it and the person who like maybe could like restart your computer if it wouldn't connect to the internet. But like it was very like later on that I learned how to code and all those other things. Even like being next to it um, for a really long time. Interesting. So you bought the book at 14. Mm -hmm. I mean maybe if you like slept on it, did you put it under your pillow or anything and like osmosis? Uh, I didn't. And I think about it like that was back like that book must have been like $40 or something like that. Right. Wow. Like this is an investment. It was an, uh, sure, a but poor investment. Open if I, I, yeah. And I think it like it's one of those books that had like a CD in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But, but what about the Geo Cities? Like, did you like get those cool animated gifts and stuff? In oh yeah, you got the right? animated. Yeah. It was Mortal Kombat fatalities. Oh, okay. Uh, so I had like the spinning like Mortal Kombat orbs of fire. Uh, there was a MIDI uh, embedded MIDI soundtrack that would play automatically. I had a lot of frames, so I had the navigation in one frame, and that would change the other frame in Netscape Navigator. It's exactly what I'd imagine a GeoCities start mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. a career would look like. Yeah, I, I I think it is long gone and lost to history. I wish that I could find it. I have I have made attempts to find it, uh, but uh, I cannot. And then Dreamweaver, Dreamweaver, I actually started with Dreamweaver mm -hmm. as well. So it was I was more on the art side, so I like to like draw and do traditional art and that kind of thing. And when I you know saw the internet, I, I wanted to take those designs and put them online mm -hmm. so dream over was like drag and drop get going yeah, so yeah. similar to something like i i think about like webflow and the whole mm -hmm. no code tools is mm -hmm. similar to that it's yeah like, yeah anyways uh at what point or at one point you became a high school teacher can you talk about that yeah middle and high school well so i mean going back to like being 15 or 16 it was either become a rock star or uh uh, software engineer, and so you know, come around 22 when I had done neither, um, I was a liberal arts major, and so I had a degree in sociology. Uh, turns out that that's not a job. Like you don't type sociologist into. It's more of a hobby these days. Uh, but you can't type sociologist into like Monster.com or what I have you back in the day and find a job doing that. Um, and so both of my parents had become like their career changed into being teachers much later in life. And so that was effectively the family occupation. So I did the New York City Teaching Fellows, which is like, um, do you have a pulse and are you willing to teach in the worst schools in, in like Brooklyn or whatever, uh, to which I said, you know, yes to both, right? And so I did that and like, you know, it paid for my master's and like, I, I think a lot about the fact that, like, I, you know, I graduated from college in 2006, right? And so I got a job as a public school teacher, like, right before the recession, um, which probably on the grand scale of things, like, wasn't the worst, like, thing in the world. I had, like, tenure, like, during the, you know, during the housing crisis. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that was a bad decision at the time, but like it was definitely, um, and like I had always, I, I say that like, oh, well, I only had a liberal arts major, right? But I had always taught in some way, shape, or form. Like my first jobs were like teaching at like a Cub Scout camp. I was like, how to identify an oak tree versus a maple tree. Um, I taught classes on like how to use like Excel or whatever in college. And so I had always been teaching in one like sense or another, like for every job that I've ever had. So it was like a natural like thing, but it was also like the, like, I didn't know what to do after I graduated college because turns out, uh, however many years of education did not actually prepare me for being a productive member of society. So that's like a special kind of teacher though, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is there any, like learnings or any any like lessons you drew out of those times i mean like, yeah, yeah there's a lot right like i mean part of that was learning how code to like solve some of those problems like that you know just trying to figure out how to like automate stuff in a in a classroom there's another thing that i think a lot about that like I think there's a whole bunch of things in that early part of my career that probably shaped later parts, right? Like, you do need to learn how to communicate somewhat well, right? And I think when, you, um, when you're when you a teacher, like, if the, if the middle school students in Brooklyn aren't getting the thing that you're teaching, you can't really blame them, right? It's, like, on you to, like, figure it out. There's this terrible question that I found out later um, when I was doing interviews for teachers in Newark through a similar program, there's this terrible question that they ask you, right? Which is, you know, you have a student that's failing, they give you some situation, how much of the responsibility is on the parent, how much is on the school administrator, how much is on you, right? And in the rubric for the question, the only right answer is 100% you. Uh, I think I must answer that because I was like, well, there's only one person I can control in this situation. Um, but I think that there's something about one, that kind of like onus on you to actually have to solve the problem. And then also like the ability to like communicate and explain things that like, if that becomes like a core part of like the way you approach situations, it turns out, I think when you go to like 
larger like corporate America, if you will, or like just regular business, like that plays out like as almost like a superpower later on. For sure. sure. And then you went to teaching at Turing, right? Yeah. So or like somehow getting into coding yeah. prior to that. So or? I um when I was teaching, uh, when I first started teaching, it was 2006, 2007, and uh, George W. Bush was the president of the United States of America, and there was no child left behind. Where they like there was adequate yearly progress for students in schools, and so you did these tests, and like if students weren't achieving, they would like hold the school accountable. Um, and at the time, the way that you collected data was you, uh, you know, I, would, I was a special ed teacher, so I would do like running records of like listening to a kid read and marking where they had made errors and stuff along those lines. And you'd mark it on a sticky note and you'd put that sticky note in a binder. And when the district came around, you pull out all the binders and they'd be like, look at all this data you've collected. Now, how are you ever going to process or read that data? Uh, a few years later, when uh, Barack Obama became president, there was Race to the Top, which was the same program, but like now, instead of sticky notes, it was in a series of CSV files, not just that you would download and you'd look at their like seventh grade score, you know, their tests in the seventh grade standardized test versus the eighth grade practice one versus the simulated eighth grade exam versus the photocopies of the one that a teacher kind of stole last year of the eighth grade exam. And you would figure out by cutting and pasting all these columns, which students you were going to take out of gym and art to make them do test prep. Um, and they would have us like spend like two or three hours after school every day, like cutting and pasting these columns and spreadsheets. And, you know, through the uh, JavaScript book that had been under my pillow and the osmosis, I'm like, I don't know how to use a relational database, but I am pretty sure that I am a human relational database right now. Uh, so I said, hey, if you let me not do this for a month, I will write you a Ruby on Rails app that uh, will just parse all this data and um, put it all together for you. I did not know how to do that at the time, but I was like, I could probably figure it out. And I wrote possibly the world's worst um, Rails app. That was it was it was terrible. It barely it barely worked, but it worked right, uh, and it still saved a whole bunch of time. And so I ended up like once they figure out you can do that, it doesn't really stop. Um, so I had like been building like little stuff like that for the school and the district that I worked in. Um, and then after Sandy hit, and like I was in Rockaway Beach, Queens, which was like destroyed by Hurricane Sandy, I ended up uh, having to take two boats and a bus to get to work each day. So I got a different job uh, where I was building interactive data visualizations and real-time apps on the web for this like educational nonprofit. So I'd been doing that for a year. So I had to like build like all these little things like over and over and over. And we'll get, it was getting a lot of reps in, and but it was predominantly self-taught and it was like slow going. Um, and then Jeff Casimir, who started Turing, uh, kind of was in town in New York City, uh, and I reached out to him about like hey, do you want to get a beer or something? And I had told my then wife that, like, one day I want to work there and I want to, like, teach, you know, coding or whatever. Um, and he's like, no, you know, I'm flying back to Denver, but uh, why don't we do a Google Hangout and see if it's a good fit? And so I prepared for this, like, Google Hangout, like, was a podcast interview. I had notes. I had questions. I was ready to rock and roll. Uh, and we talked for 28 minutes on minute 28. He was like, so I guess the next step is for you to fly out to Denver and see if it's a good fit. And so I quit my job, broke my lease, moved out with my like under two year old to a job that was so new we didn't have health insurance yet. Um, which is possibly in 2020 hindsight, like the story ends well, but in 2020 hindsight, probably wantonly irresponsible. But um, so yeah, I worked at Turing for like, I think four years, three years, something along those, those lines. And that's where I think we got in touch, right? Mm -hmm. You were right. at Turing and um, somehow you turned in turn from like a front of master's customer into a teacher right? yeah. uh, on, the on the platform. So could you maybe give us a little bit about that story? Yeah. That transition? Uh, so, you know, I started out doing like Ruby and trying to like put stuff in databases and take it back out again. And actually Jeff, who was running like a, like a Rails, like educational, like consultancy before he started uh, Turing, like had done this one course for like code school, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, on jQuery, which even though he didn't really 
know anything about it was like the one that he could do for free to like drum up business or whatever. And I watched that. And as soon as I made something change in the DOM, like with, after an Ajax call, I'm like, well, I'm not putting stuff in database and take it back anymore. This is way cooler, right? Um, so I had like kind of switched. And with all those interactive visualizations, I had to like learn a lot of stuff real fast. So I remember like holding my then one year old child in my arm while like watching like some of the earlier courses and stuff along those lines and like rapidly because I had to like build all these things in like six months. And I remember just like, watching them like constantly like while I was holding a kid or like cooking dinner or something like that as like a background track. And so it's like super interesting that like a few years later you and I ended up working together. Right. Yeah. And how did that even come about? Um, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah, I do I do remember. So I think it was like seven years ago. Um because I was start I had started the initial program at Turing was all Ruby on Rails and I was teaching some JavaScript, which then became a core of the program, and then we spun it off into its own thing. Um, at the same time, I was doing a lot of like conference speaking, uh, mostly because like we're trying to like promote Turing and stuff along those lines. Um, and met, I think Justin Searles, who then uh, had just done one. I don't want to say like coffee unit. script. No, I think it was unit testing. It was, it was a coffee like unit script. testing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think he was using. Coffee script and teaching unit testing at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so, that's what it was. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the most popular course for reasons. No, but, you know, uh, um, rip. Uh, rest in peace, coffee. Script. I mean, coffee script is incredibly important to me. I was going from Ruby to JavaScript because, like, I was very bad at JavaScript, so I'd write the answer to a problem in Ruby, and then I would translate into coffee script, and then I would look at the compiled code. <laughs> <laughs> of the coffee script to the JavaScript. That's how I kind of taught myself JavaScript. Uh, but I think, yeah, he had just done one, and him and I were friends, and so I think he introduced me to you. That's, That's awesome. awesome. And, yeah, I mean, why do you... Okay, so you mentioned that was seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So why do you continue to teach? Or like, what's driving that? I mean, you were a teacher in the past, then yeah. touring, then you're still you know, teaching courses today. So. Yeah, I think there's a few things. I think one of the things I learned early on is like, even as just an engineer, it is one thing to like, to understand enough about like any concept, like, like let's say event bubbling in the DOM, what have you. Um, you get a certain amount of understanding just from like writing code and being an engineer, but not to the level that you get if you have to explain it for like three hours. And like prepare yourself for the questions that someone might ask you as you explain it for three hours. And there's something about like the depth that you have to get into something. And the, then the fact that you get to keep that like in your knowledge. And all of a sudden you have this like deep, deep understanding of how these things work. Not because like you're smarter than anyone else, but because you had to like sit there and prepare for all this stuff. And like over time, like I think that like I've watched that like, um, like pay off in dividends and like compound, right? And so like there are there are things like I think you and I talk about this where like here's a thing that I use at work that I like use enough that I'm using it professionally. But I know that if I talk to you about like teaching a course, I will have to like seven hours know it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> in every excruciating detail. Right. And then I get to keep that forever. You know, like that's knowledge that sticks with you. Yeah. Right? you can use in your day job after teaching. Yeah, and I think that like over time if I think about like how that's like added up, like I think it's probably benefited me in my career because now I have this like again, it comes from like anyone could do it, but there's something about knowing that you have to stand in front of a room of people in 6 weeks, 4 weeks, 2 weeks, 1 week that like becomes an incredible focus function to the level that you will read the docs for Tailwind in a to a depth that you would have never read it if you were just casually using it. You know what I mean? And then you end up with better practices. You end up actually understanding all the best practices because you you know you can't get up there and just do maybe like the thing has been working for you. You have to actually you have a certain responsibility and then you get to like keep that yeah, with the workshops, their events, right? So yeah. it kind of creates that pressure cooker. Exactly. Like, you yeah. have six weeks. Exactly. Because <laughs> otherwise, I will buy a book at fourteen and not even like begin to crack it open until I'm twenty eight. <laughs> right. So I need I need a little bit of that to like keep yeah, focus. It's interesting that you say that because in a lot of ways, I hacked my own psychology mm -hmm. in that like by running these events, I know I have to do a certain amount of work and deliver mm -hmm. a certain amount of value behind the scenes. Mm -hmm to the customers and like having that cadence uh, really kind of keeps me accountable. Yeah. It's like, cause otherwise 
I would say like my default mode is I'll just kind of like play video games or <laughs> mess, mm-hmm. mess around. But like, no, if, if there's customers that are looking for this, there's an event happening. Mm-hmm. We're gonna we're gonna do the best that we can. So yeah. that's that's interesting. That that kind of works that way for you too. All right. So on teaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I mean, people watching this might know that you're not. You know that you're. Uh, they might not know that you're a prolific instructor on front of masters that you've actually taught a lot of courses right so i'm i'm going to read a list of topics of everything Bad. that you've taught and it's going <laughs> to it might be excruciating but uh, we're going to go through it and then i'll ask some follow up questions from that so you've taught react performance enterprise ui development React and TypeScript, Redux Fundamentals, Figma for Developers, Advanced Redux with Redux Toolkit, Testing with Cypress, AWS for Frontend Engineers, RxJS Fundamentals, JavaScript Performance, Build Your Own Programming Language, and then recently we did Scratch for Kids, which I was in. That was very, very fun uh, with my son. And then uh, Arduino with JavaScript, Electron is tomorrow, and then upcoming Beat and Tailwind CSS. So, of those <laughs> courses, what was the most fun to teach? I think the Scratch one was the most fun, right? Especially because it pulls together like that, like high school, middle school teacher thing, as well as like the getting the program. I think, and you and I were talking about this, like. Um, in between sessions like the other day, which is like, it's kind of interesting to see it. Oh, clones of sprites, if they have their own variable defined, use that one. If not, it goes up to the prototype. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you can see like, oh, there's an event loop happening here. It's like, to see all that kind of JavaScript stuff in there. Um, I think the Scratch for Kids one is super interesting to me too, because I think about like, I, you know, I went to Catholic school and I was like, didn't get the best math instruction. And then I was like, at that point, self-identified as like not good at math and stuff along those lines. And I think a lot about how, you know, even as we're going through this stuff, there's a certain amount of like, oh, let's talk about like velocity or gravity, right? Um, Or like an absolute value or like for a lot of games to do like a wave motion or something like that involves a certain amount of like trigonometry, right? And I think there's like a lot of really interesting stuff that makes some things where it's like, do this math equation from a textbook because you were told you to versus like, I think there's a lot of opportunities to kind of like have kids like be able to like actively want to learn these things. And games are surprisingly complex yeah. under the hood. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on. You think like, oh, I'm just going to make a game. No, it's actually probably more, quite a bit more complicated than a lot of web apps. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or, or definitely more complicated. Yeah, like you, you have state, state and game state, and start you know start screens and options and yada 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 and yeah, like you said, math to do some of the physics and yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, both our sons were there and they're building games and it's it's just like so cool because I don't remember getting that opportunity at that age, you know, and it's I don't know, I think it's going to be a really fun project to see you know if parents use that. Mm-hmm curriculum to teach their children because it was it was really really fun um how about the most difficult course to teach of all of those Oof. uh i think the other one it's the probably the other favorite that i have is like um i mean in terms of execution of difficulty like the arduino one is really hard because it's like you're live wiring on top of like coding but i think the other one uh is the building your own programming language one which i don't i don't know if it's like if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail or like what it is. But like the amount of times that I've had to like write a parser or compiler or like like navigating AST to like spit something out is like happened a shocking number of times, right? Um, and so that's like weirdly like well have I built other, have I for really reals built a programming language? Of course not, right? Because like probably nobody should. Um, but the number of times that like uh, we've had to like you know. When I worked on a you know a visual email editor and stuff along those lines, the legacy version it was not saved in any kind of data structure. It saved it like the original version just jQueried some HTML and saved it back to the database. So like to find where we're going to put the drag and drop modules, we had to take the HTML like parse it into like a AST and then like have like um, decorations on certain DOM nodes, like find it and then convert it into these like uh, JavaScript objects. And it's like the number of times that I've had to like do something like that. Um, has been kind of shocking, right? And so I think like just, I think one, 
I went, you know, there were a bunch of various books. I, like, I used a lot of, like, Peter Norvig had, like, one on, like, building a Python, a parser in Python that I kind of, like, redid in JavaScript as, like, a personal thing. And that kind of was the, like, at least the seedling of when I came to you with that one. Um, but the amount of times that I've actually had to use those skills. And it's, like, also just, like, a fun one. Because, like, once you know that you can do that, even if you don't ever, like, really, like, do it, but the idea that you could do all these things has been like a superpower in my day job. Um, I even think about so. how Rich Harris made Svelte. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Svelte wouldn't be Svelte without the ability to take like, you know, the actual syntax of Svelte yeah. for, you know, these uh, reactive whatever, mm -hmm. right? And he compiles them into JavaScript, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I mean, those skills are used in the real world with you know, mm -hmm. Svelte, yep. and uh, there's other cases, um, you know, quite a few, like you said, SunGrid, yeah. the, the editor I use every day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's and a lot of them are just not particularly glamorous. Like we use like Contentful for like the headless CMS for our website, and you know they've got great types in the library, but then you've got to like figure out how to take the schema of your data, like the actual data that you keep in there, and like cool, we can just like you know take that JSON thing, use the TypeScript. Um, AST builder and like generate like types that fit exactly what we're using, right? And like that's just using the same skills in like, yeah, not particularly glamorous, right? But like very practical versus like hand editing stuff all the time. So, wrapping up the te teaching section, uh, what tips would you have for somebody who's either thinking about getting into teaching or just, you know, wanting to teach more in general? I think like one of them. One of the things I, I think about a lot is like to do it, right? Um, like, and there's lots of opportunities, particularly like as we record this in 2023, like, um, you know, like for a general like meetup or something like that, like, especially like a monthly meetup, like, usually an organizer is desperate for content because to put on a meetup every month is a lot, right? Um, and a lot of people are like, well, I don't, I don't know enough about this thing, right? Um, in a lot of cases, the people who go to a meetup who don't know anything about it want to actually hear from somebody maybe like five steps further down the path, right? Hearing about the inner workings of like some, you know, JavaScript library from somebody who like built it is like sometimes super interesting, but not always practical because they're dealing with these like very esoteric issues and like it's super interesting on one level, but it's not always like practical. Hearing somebody who maybe uh, delve headfirst into something three months ago has been kind of immersed in it, and like here's like here's what I learned three months down the road. Um, I think for a lot of those things, like there's there's always like this feeling of like, well, I have to know everything. I have to be like, I need enough street cred. I feel like too much of an imposter to teach something. And, you know, like don't claim you're an expert on something unless you're not, right? But to turn around and teach somebody, sometimes it's easier to learn from somebody who is like three, six, maybe just a year further down the path than you. And I think like, turn around and doing it. There's always, if you think that a topic is interesting and you don't know that much about it right now, it is reasonable to think that other people think this topic is interesting and don't know a lot about it now and would appreciate at least a heads up from somebody like six months down about like what, what you've learned, right? And I think you can always, there's always some kind of like venue, like, or a, like even just, even if you are just like putting your notes out there or like you're recording a video, there's usually somebody who like will find value in that. Awesome. Let's talk about um, your transition from touring to kind of what you do now, but yeah. uh, stepping back a bit, I know you went from touring to SendGrid, yeah. right? Um, could you talk about maybe that transition from a full-time teaching role to a full-time coding role, maybe uh, a bit about that, I mm -hmm, guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did that in well, like 2017. So it's been a while now. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we had started the original Ruby on Rails slash JavaScript program at Turing, and then we started the front end program where we it was like a seven month program, but like a new class starts every seven weeks. So like when we started the second program, that was already in existence. So I had to like write curriculum, teach it, hire, then go do the next seven week piece while the next class started. And so by the end of all that, I was, um, I was tired. Um, and so I kind of wanted to like, uh, you know, like not do that for a little bit. So I, you know, I, I had, you know, Sengru was based in Denver, right? And I had, you know, been in the like Denver like community. So I knew enough 
people and like um you know somebody like recommended like oh you should check out sangrid or whatever and so i applied um i don't you know other than the fact that i applied and got a job but that came a little bit from the teaching that came from the conference being that came to like a certain amount of you know to be honest with you despite having never had a truly full-time job as a software engineer had a, had accrued enough social proof at that point to like at least get people to trust that I could write code in a in a situation like that and so I got a job um you know as a senior engineer which you know Guess. Shot right to senior. Yeah, well, then I, that was only six months like, I got promoted to principal. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah. Um, you know, and, like, yeah, was running was running the team that built that email editor that you use, uh, at least on the front-end side, um, pretty, pretty quickly. But I think part of that had come from, again, like, the ability to, like, explain ideas and, like, also having some of those best practices, like, ingrained from having to teach it and having to, like, debug, I think, the one other superpower I got from teaching at Turing was um, when some student who is working on their final project or whatever comes to you with possibly one of the most, um, let's say, gnarliest uh, implementations of something and comes to you like almost on the verge of tears asking you to like pair with them and help, you can't really like give up. Right, and you have to get very, very good at like debugging fast. So I think the two skills I got were like a depth in the conceptual knowledge and the ability to debug probably faster than like a lot of people need to. Right, and again, not from any kind of like innate talent, just from a weird situations <laughs> that had like stacked up. Um, and so for a lot of those things, I think it was easier than I expected to like transition because like I knew the fundamentals super well and you know had built example app after example app. I've never had to like live with my mistakes for as long as I do now. Um, that was, I think, the biggest like change. Um, but even like dropping into a legacy code base was not nearly as gnarly as some of the like <laughs> student code bases I've been dropped into. So it was like shockingly how quickly I found like my sea legs and that. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, yeah, so then you ended up transitioning to principal and yeah. then uh, I think Twilio bought Sangrid. Twilio acquired Sangrid. Yeah. Role or did you learn anything with like uh, you know, working with a giant company like that? Yeah. So there was like so, you know uh, like I guess what in twenty twenty hindsight is like kind of like coincidence, which is so I had um, you know I started Sangrid. I was senior engineer, um, and then I got promoted to principal engineer uh, on that product, and then. Um, we, uh, you know, you, I think you and I were talking about this earlier. Like, there was this like rewrite that needed to happen as uh, so they were transitioning to AWS from just the on-prem data centers, and that was going to like basically the 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 version that we had worked on back then was like a React hat on top of a jQuery and CoffeeScript app on top of a Rails app, and they were like removing the Rails app out from underneath, right? And so uh, we basically had to rewrite the front end as they were rewriting the back end on the move to AWS. Um, and like for the entire project, for both the front and the back end, it was supposed to be like two years. And I was like, well, if you just give me like three engineers, I can get it done in like six months. And we got it done in like five. Um, and that like through that like then had gotten promoted again to senior principal engineer, which I think that at some point they just keep tacking on more prefixes. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it really matters. Um, which you know put me like as that point I was like running or like front end engineering at SunGrid, which felt totally reasonable. There was like three front end engineering teams. Right, all of which I knew and had worked with before. It's kind of like one of those things where I was like doing the job um, for a little bit first before I actually had the title, and that felt totally tractable and reasonable. And I was reporting to the CTO of SendGrid at that time, and then Twilio acquired SendGrid, and he became the chief architect of Twilio, which through the mechanics of just org structure made me the front end architect for all of Twilio. Oh, within geez. like a month of having gotten promoted, which uh, escalated quickly <laughs> uh, and was absolutely terrifying. Um, but I did it for like two, two and a half years, so it must not have gone completely poorly. But I remember just being like, you know, this is this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> this this is escalated <laughs> very quickly underneath my feet. But yeah, yeah. Then you're 
transitioning to more of a management role than actively developing? Because it seems like you had a ton of success saying like, hey, rewrite yeah. this thing in six months, but you did it in five. Like, how did you even accomplish that? Because most people would say if their boss said do it in six, that, you know, there would be obstacles. Like, how did you manage to come on yeah, and build, build that. that, like, within the actually faster than they even... I think it's one of those things which is, like, w again, through that, like, teaching all those things, right? Like, had this, like, understanding of all the best practices and concepts, right? And so we kind of, like, laid out the underlying architecture that, like, APIs could change, but it wasn't, like, in our view layer code. And, like, we had, like, you know, built out everything in it. Like, we had thought out and, like, planned out, like, the Redux and RxJS, like, implementation, right, about... In, in fairness, with a rewrite, you have the advantage of knowing what you're building. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, yeah, you know the much, end game. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a lot, like a lot of, like, you know, I work on something now where it's like our tech debt is not like we made bad. Our, our tech debt is like things change. Like, this was a good idea, and then the reality changed, and now we regret that. Not because, like, we were sloppy back when we did it, but, like, when you're doing the rewrite, you have the, like, advantage of knowing the end game knowing all the yeah. use cases exactly write code to all of those use cases yeah. versus if the use cases completely change well yeah, yeah exactly wasn't, wasn't really built for that yeah. purpose right so i guess that transitions us into more um your role at temporal so you went from this i'm leading a ton of people mm -hmm. to right. like probably i want to write more code yeah right? i'm just yeah, intuiting I, uh, that. But. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, towards the end of Twilio, I was not, other than like writing a POC when somebody said, like, oh, we can't do that because, right? Well, oh, weird, because I just wrote a thing that does, you know, I mean, other than that, like, spite driven development, uh, which is not my finest moment, to be clear. Um, and so, well, what, you know, part of it was that my boss, uh, who I, you know, uh, the chief architect at Twilio had left. Um, and I remember when he called me on a Friday, I was like, he's like, oh, do you have time on a Friday? I was like, I'm about to leave. He's like, I'll call you. When, it, when he called me, I was like, listen, if you're calling me on a Friday. One of us is leaving this company. I'm pretty sure you would have put me on a pip. Right. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, and that was like when Tempora like slid into my emails as well. Um, but yeah, when I, part of it was, yeah, to get back to like writing the code. Cause like trying to lead and especially my role as like the front end architect was I was nobody's boss. Right. So it was like, uh, like leading through influence, which is, I think on one hand, a really powerful skill on the other hand, exhausting. Um, and so the idea of just being able to like be hands on keyboard. So like I was the first front end engineer at Temporal. So I run a team now, but at the time I was the only like official, like front end engineer at the company kind of was like, I think, I think right now I still have the most commits, but Alex is going to overtake me any day now. Uh, by the time anyone listens to this, Alex Tideman might have like overtaken me in the most number of commits to the open source code base. Um, but at least the first like a thousand commits are mine uh, or something like that. Um, so yeah, I kind of got to like go and like build an app again from like the ground up um, one more time. That's awesome. And I think about that kind of, when you get to a senior position or whatever, the, there's that pull to become a technical manager. It seems to be a recurring theme. Um, and you're like, no, I want to continue to write code. Yep. And yeah, that sounds like joining a, being the first engineer mm -hmm. at a uh, startup like Temporal seems like the perfect uh, place to do that. And I don't know, what would you say like your learnings are there with like maybe open source, right? Because I don't think you've, really did that much at some yeah, period. Like, like do yeah. you have you do you have any like epiphanies or learnings? <sighs> that there? Are stressful, right? Like, you know, all your all your dirty laundry is like <laughs> bared out in the open, right? Like I remember like I hired um my other friend Alex, um, who had worked at with me at Zen Grid and Twilio, and I remember at one point having to be like, you can't put this is a little effity. I'm not sure how it works in the comments. <laughs> in the code anymore, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, I think doing open source, like you're just kind of like out there, right? Um, we don't like, we don't get like a lot of outside contributions. It's mostly that like, we are just doing it out in the open rather than like having to manage a full like open source project or anything along those lines. Um, but it is, uh, I feel like a lot of like uh, pressure. Yeah, I bet because yeah, all the code that you write is mm -hmm. seen by a lot of people, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you're gonna get PRs and issues against it. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Um, how about like th this entire time you've kind of 
mostly focus on the React ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? So how do you feel like the React ecosystem has either helped or supported or changed over the this, you know, yeah. uh, really like yeah. last seven years or whatever you're talking about? It's interesting too. It's like a lot. Like so everything we did at SunGrid and Twilio was all React. Um, the app I work on now is actually Svelte. Uh, the website is is next. Um, so it's kind of having both of those in place. I think like React is interesting um, in a lot of ways. One, because like I even think about this in terms of like a lot of the frameworks now, which is like you think about like 10 years ago, right? Um, like writing an Angular app or an Ember app or React app were two like wildly different experiences, right? And I feel like there is a certain amount of I, you, you can probably speak to this more than I, I was a little late for the like Dojo versus MooTools versus jQuery like wars, right? I do remember that I showed up late enough to be people being like, you know, Dojo is better. MooTools is better. But, you know, jQuery had one. I feel that way a little bit sometimes about React, right? Which is like, there are a joke that I said in like 2017 or 2018 was like, my job is to basically like take the various like principles of Ember and just apply them to React. Uh, and that is basically how I've made a career. Um, but I think like having a little bit more of that, like, because em Ember was tied in with the Ruby yeah, ecosystem yeah. a bit. So you, so you probably wrote some Ember apps. Yeah, and, originally that was like yeah. the horse I had picked in the race. you keep yeah. dropping in Ember. Yeah. And like, why would you ever use Ember, I guess? If you're the year, it was, a, it was a simpler time, Mark. <laughs> yeah. uh, the year was like 2014. It sure. was a simpler time. I still love Ember. Um, and like the, a lot of the like patterns of like, you know, a lot of those patterns in the app that I built when we wrote that uh, email editor, right? This idea of like, you know, Ember data, like you kind of have different adapters, whether or not you're talking to a, like a JSON API spec versus active record, you know, the way that Rails does it. And like, you can just swap out the adapters and like not change any of your like view layer code, right? Um, and like, and it will then serialize and adapt based. So the API can change, you can switch API backends and all of the like client side, you know, the view layer and like um, model code that you wrote like stays the same, right? And so those were like principles and patterns that I took and I put, you know, brought towards the React applications that I was building, right? So like, as we were building that app and like the email editor and like, you know, the backend was like, they were going from um, various, you know, either a Rails backend, there was some Go microservices to moving everything to AWS. They had to like, they were learning, right? And so the APIs were changing all the time. And the idea that that didn't like slow us down and we didn't have to like redo anything, you're like, okay, make some tweaks over there. And so some of those patterns like played forward. But I think like one thing that like having just effectively like a lingua franca like and i don't think react is perfect um i think react has you know you, we were talking about svelte before i think one of the things about svelte that's super cool is like a lot of that happens at compile time but you again like in a svelte template you get a very limited uh set of things you can do on that view layer you get some conditionals you get an each you can await a promise like three or four other things right in jsx you get all of javascript Right, which means it all mostly happens at runtime, and I, yeah, I'm sure somebody's going to figure out how to do all that compile time at one point. So you know, React's got its problems. It's also you know a decade old at this point, right? Um, but like, I think there's a nice piece that like it being the lingua franca means everything kind of stays a little bit close to that. So it's like when I was learning Svelte, I kind of like there was a few things where like I feel like I should be able to do this, and I was, you know what I mean? Because like having at least even one major player it means everything kind of like uses that as like a center of gravity true you know <laughs> yeah it does seem like the pitch is like it's like react but it does yeah. this other way like solid jazz yeah. and quick yeah. and yada yada, yada which yada. is it's great great. great in a way if you're like just using these frameworks it means you can just apply some of these patterns and like guess and like oh yeah okay i guess that the syntax and it worked, you know is is kind of great too and i think that like we see some of that then like go back into React, right? Like, which is what you want to see is that kind of like ecosystem positive feedback loop. If you think about the fact that like, you know, query selector all and query selector, right, are inspired by jQuery, right? You know, and like having that kind of like, there's innovation, it folds back into like, what is the kind of like, um, standard, like, yeah, understanding. I mean, a lot know. of those patterns are kind of, exactly coming back to web components and people are trying to wrestle, like, how do I do all of these things that I'm used to doing with 
yeah, web standards or whatever. Web, web components one day. One day, Mark. One, maybe. One day. <laughs> maybe. One day we'll maybe. get web components and we can be done with this. <laughs> um, I do want to just pick out one random thing that we were talking about in the, the hallway prior. You were talking about this concept of kind of being left alone to write code. Mm -hmm. Like we we're talking about, okay, manager gave you six months, you did it in five. But part of that was you being left alone, like, yeah, well, to, to do your job, right? Yeah. And like, how do you get into that position? I think a lot about both early career, later career, like that we undervalue trust as an important currency, right? And trust slash social proof, right? Um, so, so you and I were talking about was um, after that project was successful. Um, I was in a one-on-one -on -one with the senior VP of engineering at, uh, at SendGrid, and there was some comment. He's like, you know, when you said, if I left you alone, you get it done in six months, I didn't think you were going to get it done. And I was like, well, then why did you let me do it? He was like, well, one, everyone else was saying two years. I didn't have a lot to lose. But two, he drew this like um, four-quadrant chart, and on one axis was like skill, and the other one was like motivation. It's like He's like, low skill motivation, you manage them out. The interesting one that I still think about a lot is high skill, like low, and maybe it wasn't motivation, but you know, use a, use as a proxy for another word. Uh, high skill, high motivation, you micromanage them, right? Because they're not, or high skill, low motivation, you micromanage them because they have a bunch of talent and abilities, but like, they're not going to do the thing. Uh, low skill, high motivation, they, you know, it's like coach, right? And then high skill, high motivation, you delegate and you leave them alone. And so a lot of it has always been like, how do you, how do you like live there? And I think a lot of that is like, there is a certain mystique that you are able to develop by just being like, you ask me what you want done, I will get it done. And like, there won't be like, well, I need the, you know what I mean? Of just like, you can build up a certain like reputation that gets you a lot of autonomy and gets you like excused from like, people looking over your shoulder all the time, like, and just be like, I just, you know, I know that it's going to get done on the timeline to a high level of quality gets you a lot of freedom that I think a lot of us, like, I think undervalue sometimes, right? Like we want permission to do this and we want like, well, I need this person to do that. And like, those are, you know, those are incredibly valuable things. But uh, if you can operate without those, sometimes you get to a point where like, you get this like trust and autonomy um, that I think is incredibly important. And like, we were talking about that, like with somebody getting started, like I think there's a certain amount of like social proof when you're first getting started, like um, the ability to like generate, whether it's blog posts, videos or something that shows that you know what you're doing is like, humans just wanna trust humans, right? Like for the most part, they want to, they're not, they're not very good at it, but they, they seek to do it. And like anything that helps you like get that certain level of like trust, uh, whether it's through your reputation, whether it's about like having some artifacts, yeah, just a light, like is incredibly like, I think valuable. Yeah, I think about that. I don't know where exactly it comes from, but it's like let your yeses mm -hmm. be yeses and your noes be noes. Mm -hmm. It's right. like figure out where you're going to say no and yeah. figure out where you're going to say yes and then do the yes mm -hmm. like to the nth degree. Yeah. And that's how you build trust because people are like, oh, wow. Then when this person says yes, they're, yeah. they're actually going to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking, right? Like, it's And shocking. if they say no, like, you know, well, they're busy, mm -hmm. right? So. <laughs> I'm going to leave them alone there too and yeah. find somebody else to do it. Yeah. And I think when you are like low drama, like that, like it becomes one easier to get people to just in inherently trust you, but it gives you the ability that like when you do say that, no, like that's not doable. Like if you are, you think about that, there's the engineering team that's constantly like, oh, we can't do that because, oh, this is going to take six months because, and at a certain point you don't, you discredit that engineering team's like estimates, right? Oh, they're always sandbagging everything, right? Versus like, yes, and like, obviously don't sign up for things you can't do. But if like, generally speaking, like you are like pretty, like you save that for when you really need it. Then when you say, no, we can't do this, it's less of like, oh, they're just sandbagging again. Oh, engineering, so like, you know, um, particular, and like you have the ability to like have those things be more meaningful by kind of like being just kind of like I think the easiest way to become autonomous is to act autonomous right and like at first it's gonna hurt <laughs> but eventually the world will kind of like line up around that you know yeah because it's hard to take something when you said yes to it and it gets hard mm -hmm. and like actually finish it. yeah yeah <laughs> it, it can get very difficult mm-hmm 
I, yeah. It's kind I'm of stressful, that, like, like whole staring into the abyss. What have I signed up? For? Yeah, and there's a few times where I've been like, "All right, we're uh, we're gonna come in hot here." You know what I mean? Like, but the idea that you, you know, I think this other piece is like when I have bitten off more than I can chew. Like, being very like, be like, "Hello," early on. Like, this is not gonna go the way that we Raise initially the thought. Yellow flag. Yeah. Yeah, Soon, sooner than later. And those things end up in trust, right? Yeah. Like that you are, when you say you're going to do something, you're going to do something. Hey, I ran into this thing. Yep. Like, yeah. Early and often versus like the everything's fine, everything's going to be all right, everything's cool. Oh, wait, everything's on fire. Isn't great. All right. So I think that's a good place to leave the current career. I have a couple questions looking forward. Mm. Um, do you have anything on your like horizon, either personally or professionally, that you're like excited about, or um, I mean, professionally, like I, I'm like just a lot of times super stoked. Like my team at Temporal is like um, two two of my former students that I taught, um, also one who taught with me at Turing, and then like also one of my former coworkers. Actually, one of them is also my former coworker from Twilio, and then also another former coworker from Twilio. So I have this amazing team, so just like showing up and getting to work with them is great, and then two other amazing humans, Grace and Laura, who went to turn and then joined our team, who I had not worked with previously. So I have like the best team ever, so like, that's fun. The thing that I think a lot about, and this goes back to like what, you know, the courses that I'm like excited about. So like we talked about before, like worked on the scratch for kids, worked on the Arduino one, which is, you know, you let me do fun ones. Um, but like, I feel like you've earned the trust. Earned the tr I've earned the trust to do fun ones. ones. Let's, do, let's see. Let's, let's see as we edit the video from the Arduino one. Uh, <laughs> like I'm, John's in the background right now, like moving pictures around. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we'll see how that one, um, I, it'll be great. Um, but I think a lot about, um, so, in when I when I was a public school teacher, there was one year where my job I wasn't in the classroom, and I like it's always like that running thing that you called out that I didn't really think about. I spent one year outside the classroom trying to teach. It was these two grants from the federal government about going into failing schools and like teaching them how to like uh, use video equipment to like record documentaries instead of five paragraph essays. Like you live in South Brooklyn, you can write a um, an essay about the Holocaust. You can interview like like survivors, right? Um, the other one was kind of just like, how do you use technology to like, okay, you listen to a lecture in the classroom and then you go home and do homework, right? Like we could theoretically generate like videos and all these things. And I remember in like 2021, uh, thinking to myself, you know, in the midst of the pandemic when, with, with a kid going to school, like clearly we've must've gotten so much better at this like hybrid remote learning and to like find out that like no we didn't like just kind of got me a little angry um so i've been thinking a lot about as we were talking about before like how do you use all these really cool things to teach kids how to like be creative even like it's like less like it's like kids need to code i don't know like maybe right but like the idea of like making stuff and creating stuff and learning through like experimentation and not just being like make two straight quiet lines and stuff along those lines. So like kind of exploring a little bit more of like the like, how do you use all of these really cool like making tools, right? Scratch, Arduinos, what have you, to like give kids a little bit better of a setup than when I trusted the system and like went through 16 years of school to find out that it was unemployable, right? <laughs> um, and like create stuff and make stuff. I think it's for me trying to figure out what that actually looks like, right? And I don't know if that's personal, I don't know if it's professional, it's some like at least passion project piece. Yeah, I think about that a lot. Obviously, we both have sons and I think about, yeah, they're yeah, their opportunity. And that's why I always tell them like, hey, you have unlimited like leash when it comes <laughs> to learning. Like, like if you're learning, learning whatever, whatever like yeah. go ahead and spend time on scratch or spend whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's fun or Legos, right? Yeah. Like, if, <laughs> like mm -hmm. throwing tons of uh, mm -hmm. cool, cool tools and seeing what they build. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, that's ultimately how we get to like innovation in a lot of ways is like, taking things from different ecosystems and putting yeah, them together. Yeah. And like just having that be just a core skill from a much earlier age. I think you and I had to like develop it a little bit later in life, you know, but yeah. like kind of like, and you think about that son's daughters too, right? Like girls like who don't necessarily get the like societal push into those things, right? Just making it super accessible. Like how does that change things like going forward? You know, and I think that there's so much, it's like, 
the opportunity has always kind of been there. It's been like the thing that's like been bubbling up, but I think now it's so approachable and so like a thing that we could do. It's like frustrating me that schools don't, right? But that seems like there. I remember when I was doing that job, um, the joke was if Rip Van Winkle woke up from a hundred year nap, the only thing he would recognize is the public education system. And that joke was ha ha funny in 2010. Yeah. It's, it's like angry. less funny now. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you know, like, it's like ha ha anger. Yeah, because there's so much of this around, and yet we don't like education hasn't changed, right? And I think you've done a lot for changing, like with the dolls and stuff along those lines. And now I think it's like there's all these like opportunities to like do it with like kids as well. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. I mean, I front of masters really came out of the fact that I was very frustrated that. You know, learning to code back then was mm -hmm. like, okay. okay, scraping together like RSS feeds and like trying to figure out what the heck is yeah. going yeah. on, buying, buying books. books in the library yeah. that are like super outdated, you know, and like how do we change the, the game for mm -hmm. like, you know, deep, like learning applicable skills like as an adult as fast as possible mm -hmm. and being able to like ramp up. So, yeah, it's, it's fun to see what kids can do. And, yeah, so I'm there with you. And I think that there should be like a – a structured, you know, thing around yeah, <laughs> letting kids experiment. I, I see like the code ninjas and there's some, you know, there's some things popping yeah, up for kids, kids but, but there's not a whole lot of like large scale change the game. For, yeah. Um, and it's like hard, this. right? Like public yeah, education so. moves slowly, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how about, uh, let's see, how about any, like bucket list things, like <laughs> is it, let me places you want to travel or things uh, that you want to do with your your son or whatever. Yeah, uh, bucket list. Thing. I think at one point, I like he's going to be eleven next month, uh, and so I'm kind of waiting a few years. It's like I kind of want to get one of those like around the world like plane tickets, right? So I'm very like stingy with my points right now. <laughs> Just like, you know, uh, I think that'd be cool. I think, yeah, kind of traveling, going places with him as well, right? Like I, I've been kind of. I've been thinking a lot about having, like, I, you know, to, to try to, like, tie this all back together. Let's see if I can do that. Um, you know, I think a lot about how, like, I always wanted to code. And it took, like, you know, a decade before I sat down and, like, learned it, right? But, it, like, I feel like I've done okay, right? I feel like I've learned how to code. I think I can fly, fly the mission accomplished banner on that one. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, you know this about me. Like, I, a year ago, like, I've never been able to, like, sing. So I started, like, taking singing lessons just to be like, let's take other things that I thought I couldn't do or ne always wanted to do and never been able to do. And, like, let's find out what other ones we can, you know, uh, you know, do with that. And it's, like, kind of fun to, like, challenge those, like, assumptions about oneself and, like, disabuse yourself of the fact that you can't do this, or you're not good at this, or you're born without the ability to do this. And like, to do I do I fancy myself a good singer? No. Am I better than I was a year ago? And like, you know, at a certain age, you don't get a lot of those anymore, right? Unless you like seek them out. But they are like very like compelling and addictive once you like check off one of those things. I never could do this. Now, maybe I'm not amazing at it, but like, I can't say that I can't do it, right? Like, and to see that improvement feels good, you know? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I'm doing the same thing with gymnastics. <laughs> like, there's no way, shame, shape, and form did I ever believe I could do a standing backflip. Yeah. <laughs> it's just and then you do something. it. Yeah. 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 And then you do it, yeah. And then it's like, okay, that's all, you know, I want to do this a lot mm -hmm. because, yes. I, mean, I mean, if I learned it when I was young, like, you know, there's quite a few kids that can do that sort of thing. And, they might lose it as an adult or whatever, and that's part of the natural course of life. But if you learn something as an adult, like mm -hmm. you're talking about singing yeah. or whatever, in my case, flipping, it's like, I want to do that a lot. Mm -hmm. like, I, I, I want to see how far I can go with it, yeah. even though, yeah, I'm never going to be a Olympic <laughs> athlete. Or in your case, like, you know, maybe one day you will lead the st Spotify charts. But maybe. But. <laughs> and it's nice to, like, do something without the stress around it. Like, I feel like if you had handed me, I mean, I know this, like, if you'd handed me your time when I was 15, like, there's something about being that age where it's like you grab a guitar and next thing you know you want to be, like, on the warp tour, right? You know what I mean? Like, and there's something nice about when you grab a guitar or try to like open your mouth at like in your late thirties, um, where you know that likely like, uh, listen, I'm not s sleeping in a van. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, when you know that you don't necessarily have that same like 
grand ambition you're doing it for something for the like feeling of like growth right mm -hmm. and like you're not doing it with these like uh, illusions of grandeur i think there's something sure. very like relieving about that yeah. yeah it's like you're you have a, a stable job and a <laughs> stable foundation yeah, in life. life and then you can experiment over here with something fun and like low risk the, you know yeah. like with low expectation and you're just kind of like and then you kind of like you get the dopamine hit of like growth and it feels amazing you know yeah i can't think of a better way to end the podcast i think you wrapped it up so yeah i appreciate your time steve thank you uh, yours. yeah uh, peace peace Hey, before you go, don't forget we're new at this. So any type of feedback, whether it's a like and subscribe or whether it's a comment about what you didn't like about the episode, what you do like moving forward, uh, we'll be sure to take your feedback into the next one. We've got a lot of great ideas for the podcast. I'm really excited. These conversations are super fun. So we hope to keep continuing. So uh, yeah, spread word about it. And thanks a lot for listening. Peace.